I was quite uh, impressed with the outpouring of support by the global business community, which I've come to appreciate the permanent role Nigeria plays in Africa. For the purpose of perspectives, one out of every four black men is a Nigerian. And by 2050, we are projected to be the third most populous nation on earth. With so far, the United States, our population will be 440 million people. By then, one out of every three black men is a Nigerian. And by the end of the century, we will be the most populous nation on earth. Certainly, this is the most populous country in Africa and its largest economy. Wherever Nigeria goes, that's where Africa goes. And the trajectory of global growth is facing Africa, and Nigeria will make Oma their destination. Our presence was relative, especially in the light of some power reaching decisions taken by the present administration to also position the economy. Oil subsidy the successive administration had been an albat cross round our neck. The president summoned the political willpower to remove the oil subsidy. And we know the consequences of unveiling a masquerade with a huge cabal that peace pack on the oil subsidy scam. Look at the multiple exchange rate regimes that provided room for electric shady practices. We collapse the multiple exchange rates, the multiple taxation. The president has set up a committee to synchronize our taxes and come up with a single line taxation system. So the global community was filled. We had had a lot of positive interface, positive interactions. And very soon, our efforts will start yielding fruits. We are not a poor nation by any standard. We are not a poor continent. We want to deal with people on a pedestal of equality. We do not come to the West with a begging bowl, no. We want to deal with them on mutually beneficial terms because ours is the richest continent in the world. The whole country is of Europe. Their resources are not up to the resources in the Democratic Republic of Congo. This is why I said we carry our poverty with dignity. We are not here. Wherever we go, we go to have mutually beneficial relationships with uh, Western nations and with Western entities. Well, understandable, the African leaders at this uh, conference have been also talking about private sector, government, investment, support for the African uh, continental free trade agreement. But the question to ask is, is Africa ready, particularly for the fourth industrial revolution, which is one of the major issues here, particularly with regard to artificial intelligence, technology, and what lessons, if any, can Africa learn from Europe and Asia? Mm -hmm. Remember at this conference, President Macron was talking about better financial integration in Europe. Is Africa ready? Well, uh, Africa needs the agricultural age. Africa needs the industrial age. We are now in the knowledge driven post industrial age, dominated by big data, artificial intelligence, biotechnology, and we are uniquely positioned to really leapfrog into the new age because this is knowledge driven and Africans are doing marvelously well in that arena. As Charles Darwin rightly said, it's not the strongest or the most intelligent of the species that survive, but those that are adaptable to change. And Alvin Topler equally posited something similar to that. The future shock. Yes. The illiterates of the 21st century are those are not those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn and learn and relearn. We 
are poised to take advantage of the digital revolution. For instance, by 2035, according to Corn Perry, a global consultancy output, the world will suffer from 65 million global talent deficit. The United States of America, Russia, Brazil will all suffer from 6 million talent deficits. Even the global outsourcing capital of the world, India, will only have 1 million surplus. So we are in a unique position. 230 million people, 75% are below the age of 30. Digitally equipped, very much at home with digital technology, we can really take advantage of the digital revolution and occupy our rightful place in the committee of nations. The present administration is forced to take advantage of this. There is a 680 million IDAIS uh, program, whereby we want to create 2 million digital jobs every year. The highest we have ever gotten from oil was $35 billion in 2011 under President Goodluck Kebele Jonathan. But India, in the year 2024 alone, India is generating $100 billion from our sourcing business alone. So I believe we need to change the dynamics, come to terms with global realities, diversify our sources of funding, and reposition our nation in its rightful place in the community of, of, of nations. And luckily, we have a very competent, a supremely competent young man, the Minister of uh, Communication. Well, I mean, one of the uh, points you have made at this conference is that uh, entrepreneurial capitalism yes. is uh, embedded in the Nigerian, uh, in the average Nigerian. Yes. Uh, but what exactly is the administration doing to allay the fears of investors, particularly with regard to issues like providing a level playing field for both local and foreign investors, addressing certain macroeconomic distortions, addressing issues such as foreign exchange, industrial policy. Some of those issues came up yesterday during the Nigerian uh, Business yes. Forum. Yes. Uh, those questions were raised. What exactly is the administration doing to build that confidence in the same people who are saying should come and invest in Nigeria? You know, luckily we had a success story to showcase at that forum, at that dialogue, the indo experience. When he was invited by former president, uh, to come and take over NAPCON. We were reluctant. He was literally dragged onto the space. But now, Indorama is minting money for that enterprise. Certainly, I cannot downplay the fact that we have challenges, especially in the apex market. But the government is making concerted efforts, coming up with modern solutions, and I believe that no matter how long the night is, it must give way to the light of the dawn. Stormy the weather might well be, but it won't rain forever. We are calling open novel solutions to address our apex deficits. In the coming weeks and months, I believe, anchored on reality and expectation, that will weather the storm and stabilize the market. Most importantly, we have to create the enabling environment. We have rightly captured it. Rule of law, sanctity of contracts, and our tendency to play block on policies. We we'll make pronouncements today. Next week there will be a change of policy. These are issues that we are going to frontally address, and we are willing to adhere to global best practices for Nigeria to thrive. In Nigeria tribes, Africa has tried. But then what do you say to concerns that have also been expressed about insecurity and also corruption in Nigeria? Well, as far as the issue of insecurity is concerned, it's an issue that is agitating the minds of my president. Efforts have been made to frontally address issues of kidnapping, for ransom, 
prices in the Niger Delta, which is the nation's lifeline. Boko Haram have been largely degraded. Five, sixteen, eight years ago, since we are in Batshin. But like most of we are buried the other heads in the northwest and in the north central sub regions. The president is rigid in the security architecture and see to it that the issues of security are promptly addressed in the coming weeks and months. Well, you were part of, uh, you were one of the speakers at a panel on how to restore faith in the global system to re-emphasize the importance of multilateralism. And at this conference, one of the issues, the themes, is has to restore, rebuild trust. Yeah. Now, do you think uh, how that will be so easily achieved, given the fact that there are schisms between the North and the South, and uh, suspicions about energy transition and uh, climate adaptation, climate financing? Do you think that the world is fractured? beyond immediate redemption. Well, uh, I spoke at a function. Within five minutes, a friend sent me a transcript of that my presentation, captured by a rise, back to me here in Davos. The world has gone beyond being a global village. We are now a global Libya home. So our lives, our fortunes, are intertwined. And as Jerry Roosevelt said in his inaugural speech, when he became the United States president, it was at the height of the Great Depression. Despair and despondency was ruling the nation. He said the only thing we have to fear right, is fear. Itself. The most important thing to rebuild confidence, trust. It has to be anchored on empathy. And the realization that as John Don said, the man says, diminish me because I am involved in mankind. Never seem to know for whom the bell tolls is told for thee. We are one big family. But the world needs leaders that do not see leadership in terms of electoral cycles, but have the vision, have the focus, have the ambition an appreciation of the dynamics of the world. Why are the Winston churches? Why are the Charles de Gaulle's? Why are the Theodore Roosevelt's? The Mahatma Gandhi's? The Jawaharlal Nehru's? The Nelson Mandela's? The Haile Selassie's? Who are these quality leaders that will put the interests of humanity over and above the interests of individual nations or communities? Because what binds us together Supersedes whatever that divides us. I always tend to give the example of what happened in Syria. Two million Syrians, Arabic speaking Syrians, knocking on the doors of Europe and it caused Brexit. It brought about the emergence of Donald Trump across the Atlantic. So, what binds us together supersedes what divides us. We as leaders. We need to subsume our differences and work for the collective glory of humanity. Yeah, but this is the problem again with globalism. Uh, this Davos conference is the rich, the powerful, the elites of the world talking to themselves, trying to shape the future and solve the world's problems. The poor, who are the hardest hit by all of these problems, they are never at the table. They are not part of the conversation. And some critics say, why would the rich and the powerful think that they can think for the rest of humanity? What do you think? Well, I slightly beg to differ from that perspective because we have democratically elected leaders who represent constituents. And even at the dinner of the launch yesterday, most of the speakers were not even white people. Our own Rosie Okonye Ewala was one of the major speakers. The MD of the, the chief executive of the World Health Organization, uh, the Ethiopian with the tongue twisting name, I can't recall the uh, out his name. So it's a global community of a kaleidoscope of colors. 
people from the business community, from the political leadership, from the NGOs. One of the speakers was Al Gore. He's a driver of changing the environmental scene. So that goes to show that it's not correct for people to define it in terms of an old white show or an old male show. But the global community that represents the kaleidoscope of colors that constitutes us as a world. Well, Nigeria is still cruel independent. Mm -hmm. We still run significantly monocultural uh, economy. Mm -hmm. But where do you see the future of Nigeria at a time when the rest of the world is talking about artificial intelligence, talking about climate adaptation, energy transition, and we're still depending on revenue from oil? using oil as a major benchmark? Well, uh, if you observe this trend, oil as a percentage of our GDP is gradually declining. Telecommunications is ruling the waves. I see in Nigeria in the next 20, 30 years running a diversified economy with the income largely coming from the digital world, from digital commerce, with the income coming from agriculture, with the income coming from value addition in our natural resources, it goes beyond exporting raw material. A ton of cocoa. How much does a ton of cocoa worth? No more than four thousand dollars. But they will take it to Europe, the cadres of this world, will produce the bounties and the mass, and will buy it at ten times the price. So I believe that in the next couple of years we are going to reposition the Nigerian economy, especially with the emergence of the African free trade zone area. We will be in a position to be the dominant force in the African continent and add value to our commodities so that uh, the issue of dependence on fossil fuel, because I foresee a situation whereby probably in the next 20 years or even less, Oil will be what coal is to Newcastle. But the beauty of the Nigerian experiment is that we are largely a gas nation, not an oil nation. And gas will continue to be relevant in the scheme of things for the next 50 to 100 years. Okay, um, Mr. Vice President, let's talk about the perception of this year trip back home. Mm -hmm. um, yesterday, here in Davos, <coughs> there was a Nigerian business forum. Then there was the Nigerian night. Yes. Where Nigerian culture, cuisine, art, heritage was showcased. But the thing that Nigerians back home have seen was the spectacle of you dancing to uh, Kiss Daniel's uh, Buga <laughs> or thing. And some of them are saying, ah, other people are talking about climate change and serious issues. Is it that Nigeria went to uh, Davos to go and showcase uh, food and culture and all that? What is the strategic pitch? Uh, advertising the Nigerian way of life. At the we have a region, a grand region called Nigeria Destination 2030. We can run down away from the park. The Nigerian arts, culture are creating webs in the global scene. And Nigeria has been out of doubles, out of the global scene for quite some time. This is, it was a problem for us to reintroduce uh, Nigeria and Buga dance is only becoming our second national anthem. So we have to showcase Nigeria. We have Nigerians that are making waves in the arts world, in the fashion industry. The Black Hawk uh, by uh, what is her name? By this young lady is creating waves in on Netflix. While Richard Moffe Damijo was a lead actor. Some of our artists, Bruce Bonner, Brad Bear, Ben and Wong, Shoni Barry, Jimo, are creating works in the global scene. So we believe that we can maximally tap into our soft tower energy. Our passions for the works in West Africa. So we are here to sell the Nigerian brand. Nigeria goes beyond corn artists only. Uh, on the internet. Last week, the hottest news in the global finance industry is about the sale of global infrastructure led by 
in Nigeria and buy a women see for twenty point five billion dollars to Blackstone. And it might interest you, sir, to know that the rich kid in the Blackstone family is a young Nigerian, one of the best graduating students at Harvard, Dr. Tony Oki. So Nigerians are creating waves. And we have to be the ambassadors of our nation, showcasing our potentials in passion. Dino Sagori, Lisa uh, Polario, so many of our patient designers, Sadi Kari, uh, Biba, so many of them are doing well. And we think that we need to highlight our areas of strength to sell the Nigerian brand. Okay, I have one more question. Yes, sir. This is uh, more or less your first international travel. Yes, sir. Since the presidency announced that entourages on local and international travels will be reduced. And that the vice president, when he goes on foreign trips, will travel with just a delegation of five. Yes. And it's been reported that on this trip, you can with just about five persons. Yeah. But how convenient is that? Is it, is it, is it a bit uh, difficult? Is it uh, inconveniencing? to have a small team considering the scope of activities that you've been involved in? Well, considering the state of our economy, the parallel state of our economy, sacrifices have to be made by the leadership as well as the followership. You know, we have to walk the talk. I came with a presidential jet. You came on a commercial plane. So it's not the numbers that count, but our ability to sell the Nigerian brand. I'm wholly in alignment with the president's decision to scale down the number of our entourage because perception counts. When we go with huge delegations, Nigeria seems to be disgusted. And the recent pronouncements on scaling down the number of delegations actually align very well with the Nigerian populace. And I believe that in the fullness of time, it will have its net effect on our economy. Honestly, there is no cause for one to complain. We had a good show in Davos. And in future trips, this is not cast in iron that we must go with five or six or ten. The most important thing, especially with regards to the president, on local trips, there are tendencies for us to compute for the president to look at some of these people. For instance, if the president is going to let's say Niger State or Sokoto or Ogo. The local security architecture there can easily handle the security of the president. But it is going to make me my own hometown with our antecedents of Boko Haram insurgency in the state. There has to be, we have to look at the, this is why when he went to Oweri, there was a lot of noise in some part of the social media that he went with. Uh, uh, security support from Abuja. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. But here, yeah, I came with five. The president will certainly go with 20. And it makes a lot of sense because we have to walk the talk. And Nigerians are happy for that. Well, but the question that many Nigerians ask again is how far would the administration be willing to go in terms of cutting costs? beyond just reducing the size of uh, presidential the presidential The government is poised to see to it that we streamline our government machinery and see to it that costs are reduced. Beyond the foreign troubles, even the cost of running the government is homogeneous. And we are looking at it, and in the coming weeks, the government will come out with a blueprint. If possible, how to match some agencies that are virtually performing the same functions. So that in that way, I believe the cost of governance will come down. Well, finally, Mr. Vice President, one of the uh, points uh, out there on social media is that all you are in Davos that nobody has heard from you on the uh, crisis in the Badon, where there have been explosions, a number of people have died, and in, in Abuja, where you have a way, a lot of kidnappings and all of that. Mm -hmm. Well, our heart goes out to the victims of the Badon 
uh, explosions, which was largely caused by illegal miners storing explosives. And the president had come out to show empathy and support to the government and people of Oyo State. And he had directed NEMA to immediately swing into action. NEMA is under the canopy of the vice president's office, had been in constant touch with the management of NEMA to see to it that the needs of the people are addressed. Locally, the Nigeria said one life loss and cold blood is as gruesome as millions lost in a program. Locally, but sadly, only two people lost their lives in Ibadan. On the issue of the kidnappings in the Abuja Axis, is I said is receiving very, very prompt attention from the government. I have spoken to the president three times. It's something that is agitating his mind. He has asked the security chiefs to come up with a roadmap towards addressing holistically the entire security challenges across the nation. And it's not going beyond us. We are going to outlive them. We're fine. And definitely, uh, Nigeria has the capacity to win. I am an unrepentant optimist in the can do spirit of Nigeria. Um, the Vice President, kudos to him, he said a lot of very important things there, talked about climate change, talked about the dichotomy across the global West, you know, talked about the state of play, the polity, you know, also made his uh, due commiserations as regards what happened in all your state, the explosion, which was also a failure of the system and the government. And because when you look at that case critically, there are regulations and guidelines as regards who procures explosive for what. Where those guidelines followed, those are the investigations we'd like to know as regards that matter. And the sad part is that bombing was, was really avoidable if every hand was on deck. He also talked about you know, the state of play of the economy. And I like the fact that he said, yeah, Nigerians are not beggars. Yeah, Nigeria is a potentially rich country. But underline the word potential. There's a difference between potential energy and kinetic energy. You can have a latent potential, but if you don't activate it, and how do you activate the potential rule of law, removing corruption? Imagine the EFCC boss was only saying the other day that about 2.9 trillion in the space of how many years? Three years for corruption. In fact, he said the situation is so bad that most of his investigators collect bribe. And you're wondering, why is he telling us in the first place? He should get those investigators as if they are ready to collect bribes and not do the right job. Those monies could be used to do 1,000 kilometers of road, like he said. So the problem that has always been devil Nigeria is corruption. It's not that we're bereft of potential. Yeah, that's why when you like the likes of uh, Adebayo Vulesi with you know GIP Global Infrastructure Partners, okay. uh, the work he had done with Gatwick, you know, now joining the BlackRock Group that further accelerated uh, Adebayo Vulesi's uh, worth in dollars. I think it's my worth about two point three billion dollars. The deal was about twelve billion dollars, and it's got about twelve point five billion of uh, BlackRock shares, which is about one of the biggest, you know. Uh, companies in terms of investments in the world and also the sundry issues as regards the economy it is because we have not harnessed the potential and I like the way he spoke he was very frank about it and part of the harnessing the potential will be cutting cost of government so it's not just about cutting the aids and cutting them to five or no it's considerably cutting the cost of government do we really have the capacity to be keep taking this 10 trillion deficits budget by budget cycle do we have the capacity that we keep printing money that is causing a lot of inflation in our economy, but we don't see the accountability for the money? That's why the case of those COVID-19 funds really shocked me. Because I had those monies were not even our money, were monies that were borrowed and printed. So Nigeria has not bereft of that potential to do great things. In fact, we have more than enough. There is every single place you go in Nigeria, you have a mineral resource or the other. But the question is, how can you activate that potential? You need fortress leadership. And what Nigeria leads are leaders. You don't need politicians. Politicians think of the next election. Leaders think of the next generation. Who are leaders? People like Awolowo. Awolowo was fortress enough to use one third, one over three, of his budget to focus on education. Till today, there are many people that the only education was, they got was free education. He focused on the infrastructure. We still talk about those things till dates. Most of the investment he made with the Odua group still exists today. The company they set up their Odua investment still exists today. Look at the hotels in Lagos, airport hotel and the likes. 
So that's why we're seeing forthright leadership. And you talked about that. And also he talked about, you know, the dichotomy of the global south. Yes, and the, you know, these are these the wars we have in the world and the fight for supremacy. The Greek uh, philosopher and thinker, to see that it's called something, to see that it's trap that is happening when a certain power wants to overtake the other power. If you remember the Peloponnesian Wars, and that's what is happening. China, the East, wants to overtake the West. There's a fight for supremacy. There's a fight for alignment. How can we be strategic? How can we cascade into the new frontier using AI, new technology? I was happy about the fact that they talk about the, fact the next 10 years, you know, the telecom sector will blow. It's already yeah. blown. Look at when we rebase the economy in the country, it was the telecom sector that made Nigeria a 500 billion economy. So there's so much potential. We have a lot of young people. Africa alone will be the next frontier. Population will grow to about 440 million in Nigeria. One in four people you see as black people would be in Nigeria. And they are young people. The age demographic is between 60 to 30 something. So Nigerians are relatively young. How can we harness all of this? It goes back to thinking. And our leaders should not be wicked. The French have a word they call him Michon. It means wickedness. Some of our leaders are too wicked. Stops thinking, thinking, it stinks.